Hey guys and welcome to Hot Gastro. In today's video, we'll be talking about hemochromatosis. So let's get started. So what is hemochromatosis? If we take a closer look at the word hemochromatosis, we see that it can be broken down into two main parts. The word hemo, which means pertaining to blood, and the word chromatosis, which is a condition of abnormal skin pigmentation in any part of the body. So the word hemochromatosis tells us two main points about the disease, in that the disease affects the blood in some way, and it also causes an abnormal skin pigmentation in the body. So now let's expand on this definition of hemochromatosis. So hemochromatosis is a disease in which too much iron builds up in the body. Our bodies need iron, but too much of it becomes toxic to the cells in our body. If one has hemochromatosis, it means their digestive tract will absorb more iron than they require. This causes their bodies to have no other natural way to get rid of the extra iron, therefore causing the excess iron to begin depositing into bodily tissues, especially in the liver, the heart, the hormonal glands, and in the pancreas. This extra iron causes serious damage to these organs and without treatment may cause these organs to fail. So essentially what we get from this definition is that hemochromatosis is a disease in which we have too much iron building up in the body. And this iron builds up in the blood at first and then essentially deposits into the various organs listed. So the most commonly affected organs for hemochromatosis is the liver, the heart, the hormonal glands, which includes the pituitary gland, the thyroid and parathyroid glands, the ovaries, the testes, and the adrenal glands. And finally, the last organ that can be affected is the pancreas. So below we have a picture of what iron overload looks like in the liver. We see a healthy liver, which is able to metabolize iron in a good way. And then we see a liver affected with hemochromatosis where the iron essentially becomes too much for the liver to handle. So now let's talk about the types of hemochromatosis. There are two main types of hemochromatosis. The first one is called primary hemochromatosis, and this is a hereditary or genetically determined form of disease. And then the less frequently caused is a secondary hemochromatosis, meaning acquired during life. So in primary hemochromatosis, we have genetic defects that occur at specific chromosomes in the body. So there are a few specific gene mutations that have been recorded in history that can be attributed to the development of the disease. And those specific gene defects include the HFE mutation, the HJV mutation, the TFR2 mutation, and the HAMP mutations. And these all cause primary hemochromatosis. And then less frequently, we can have the secondary form of hemochromatosis, which is acquired during life. So this could mean an end stage of liver disease due to hepatitis or due to liver cancer or parasites in the liver, or it could also be due to chronic alcoholism, etc. So this is how end stage liver disease can cause hemochromatosis. Other causes of secondary hemochromatosis include a blood transfusion, excess dietary intake of iron, and so forth. But we'll take a closer look at these now. So let's take a closer look at primary hemochromatosis. The overwhelming majority of hemochromatosis cases depend on mutations which occur in the HFE gene. The HFE gene was discovered in 1996 and was thought to be the only gene that was associated with the development of hemochromatosis. But since then, other genes have been discovered and sometimes are grouped together as the non-HFE-related hereditary hemochromatosis cases. Most types of hereditary hemochromatosis have an autosomal recessive inheritance pattern, while type 4 has an autosomal dominant inheritance. So if you look at this table on my left, we see that primary hemochromatosis can be further subdivided into four main types. So type 1 is the classical form, and the mutation occurs in the HFE gene. And then we have type 2, which is also called juvenile hemochromatosis. And here we see mutations in the HJV gene, which is also known as the HFE2 gene or the RGMC gene. Uh, another form of juvenile hemochromatosis is type 2B, 
And here we have mutations in the HAMP or the HFE2B genes. In hemochromatosis type 3, we see mutations in the TFR2 or the HFE3 genes. And finally, in type 4, we have mutations in the SLC11A3 genes or the SLC40A1 genes. So the first three types have an autosomal recessive pattern of inheritance, and that means dad can be a carrier and no condition, mom can be a carrier with no condition because they both have a good gene that suppresses that bad gene that they have, and that means 75% of the kids will be healthy. Uh, two of them will be healthy carriers, one of them will be completely healthy, and one of them can inherit two bad genes, which means the child will develop the condition. And that's because he has two bad genes and we have an autosomal recessive inheritance, so he will go on to develop the disease. So let's take a closer look at the pathophysiology of hemochromatosis. In most cases of hemochromatosis, more than 80%, a specific mutation, which is called the C282Y mutation, occurs in the HFE gene on chromosome 6. And this causes a loss of function of the HFE gene product. So if we take a closer look at chromosome 6, on the short arm, we see there is a base pair substitution. So where we are supposed to have cysteine in this area, we have tyrosine, which replaces it. And this is the actual mutation that occurs at this point. And once this happens, people with hemochromatosis have an increased mucosal iron absorption. This is due to inappropriately decreased expression of the iron regulatory hormone called hepcidine. And hepcidine serves to decrease the export of iron from the reticular endothelial cells and absorptive enterocytes. Thus, in patients with hemochromatosis, we observe an increased iron release from these cell types, elevated circulating iron, and the iron deposition in vulnerable tissues. So all that basically means is that once this mutation occurs on chromosome number 6, we have a decrease in the expression of the iron-regulating hormone called hepcidine. So if you look down at this picture in the bottom right corner, you'll see that in a normal case, we have hepcidine being released by the liver, and this actually regulates these little channels called ferroportin. They act on these channels, and they are able to control the absorption of iron from the absorptive enterocytes. So the absorptive enterocytes are basically the cells that absorb iron from the intestine. So this is a little picture of the human intestine. So when hepcidin is decreased, which is in this picture, this is an HFE-related caused hemochromatosis, we see that the amount of hepcidin is decreased, therefore it can't act on these ferroportin channels. These ferroportin channels are basically gates for iron, and therefore the iron just sl keeps slipping through into the bloodstream. Eventually we have too much iron in the blood and therefore too much iron in all the organs of the body. So this hepcidin hormone is very important. And in patients who suffer from hemochromatosis and who have this mutation in this gene called the HFE gene, we have a decreased production of hepcidine and therefore an increased absorption of iron from the enterocytes. So taking a closer look at secondary hemochromatosis, this is the one that's acquired during life. So the causes here, we have multiple frequent blood transfusions, either whole blood or just red blood cells, which is usually needed by patients with hereditary anemias, such as beta thalassemia major, sickle cell anemia, and diamond black fan anemia or by older patients with severe acquired anemias, such as myelodysplastic syndromes. So too many blood transfusions in patients with anemias could actually cause an iron overload in the body and lead to hemochromatosis. Another cause could be excess parenteral iron supplements, which can acutely cause an iron poisoning. We can also have an excess dietary iron intake, which is due to eating too many foods high in iron. So Examples of these are the beef spleen, the pork liver, clams, potatoes, beans and lentils, spinach, and fortified cereals. And the last cause of secondary hemochromatosis is chronic liver diseases, such as chronic hepatitis C infection, alcoholic liver disease, or even non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So what are the signs and symptoms of hemochromatosis? 
Most patients with hemochromatosis will remain asymptomatic until they reach their middle ages. Female patients, however, generally develop symptoms before males. The first symptoms that patients may experience include joint pain due to arthritis, abdominal pain, fatigue, weakness, and vertigo. Later signs and symptoms of the disease may include diabetes, and this is due to damage to the pancreas due to the excess iron accumulating in the pancreas, and that can lead to diabetes. There can also be a loss of sex drive and impotence, and that is due to the excess of iron accumulation in those specific organs of the body that we mentioned earlier, such as the hormonal organs, the ovary, and the testes. So this excess iron can lead to erectile dysfunction and impotence and loss of sex drive in men, and it can also lead to the absence of the menstrual cycle in women. Another later sign of hemochromatosis is heart failure, and this is due to the excess iron in the heart affecting the heart's ability to circulate enough blood for the body's needs, and this is called congestive heart failure. Hemochromatosis can also cause abnormal heart rhythms, and these are called arrhythmias. And finally, we have liver failure with hepatomegaly and a progression to liver cirrhosis, which is scarring of the liver. So how can one diagnose hemochromatosis? The first step is a blood test, and there are two key tests we can use to detect iron overload in the blood. The first test we can do is a serum transfer and saturation test, and this test measures the amount of iron bound to a protein called transferrin that carries iron in the blood. Transferrin saturation values, which are greater than 45%, are considered too high. We can also measure the serum ferritin levels and this test measures the amount of iron which is stored in the liver. Another test we can use are the liver function tests and these tests help us to identify liver damage by measuring the levels of specific liver enzymes such as ALT, AST, alkaline phosphatase, GGT and bilirubin and these will all be increased in patients with hemochromatosis. We can also use the MRI, and this test is a fast and non-invasive way to measure the degree of iron overload in the liver. We can also test for those specific gene mutations we discussed. So testing DNA for specific gene mutations, such as the HFE gene mutations, etc., can shed some light on whether the patient has an hereditary form of hemochromatosis. We can also do a biopsy of the liver. And here, liver samples can be taken and checked by a histopathologist for the presence of iron, as well as for the evidence of liver damage, especially scarring of the liver or cirrhosis. And finally, let's talk about the treatment of hemochromatosis. So there are four main goals of treating hemochromatosis, and they include reducing the amount of iron in the body to normal levels, preventing or delaying organ damage from an iron overload, treating the complications of the disease, and maintaining a normal amount of iron in the body for the rest of the patient's life. So our first therapeutic approach is a therapeutic phlebotomy, and in this technique, we can safely and effectively treat the patient by removing blood from the body, and this is called a phlebotomy, on a regular basis, just as if one were donating blood. The second therapeutic method is an iron chelation therapy method, and iron chelation therapy uses specific medicines to remove excess iron from the body. The medication can be injected into the body or it can be taken as a pulp. The medication binds excess iron, allowing the body to expel iron through the urine or stool by a process called chelation. Thirdly, we can try educating the patient to make some dietary changes to start by avoid taking iron pills, including iron supplements, iron injections, or multivitamins that contain iron, limiting foods in their diet, which have a high iron content, such as shellfish, liver, spleen, spinach, etc. They can also limit their alcohol intake, and drinking alcohol increases the risk of liver disease, so it can also make the existing liver disease worse. So therefore, we ask the patient to restrict their alcohol intake. We also have to use the support of various other physicians and specialists in the treatment of the complications because we have multiple organ systems which are damaged in patients who suffer from hemochromatosis. So liver disease, heart problems and diabetes will all require different medical treatments and may involve input from various specialists such as a cardiologist, a gastroenterologist, a diabetologist, etc. 
And that brings us to the end of this video on hemochromatosis. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please make sure to like, comment, subscribe, or share. Hope you found the presentation very interesting and informative. If you would like to download a copy of the presentation, please make sure to click the link in the description. Take care and bye for now.